Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, according to my clock, it is nine o'clock. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click the record button here and let somebody else into the meeting. Okay, and I think we're ready to get started. Um, welcome everyone to day three of our um, payroll overview training. Um, yesterday, um, for those of you that were on the session, um, Andrea covered um, the payroll process, and um, today we're going to end our week of um, our three days of, of the payroll side of things with sort of all those things that can happen um, after the payroll is has been posted. Um, so we're going to talk about things like re, um, retirement reporting, OD, ODJFS reporting, um, afford reporting, processing those employer um, paid benefits, um, processing the direct deposit, your HSA file, um, outstanding payables, and then um, if and when it's the appropriate time to process um, the employee benefit accruals, um, we'll, we'll end this morning with um, talking about that. So, um, you know, again, here's the agenda. And as we've um, pointed out um, the last two days. Um, if you go to the SSDT meetings and trainings page, um, again, um, off to the left-hand side, there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a child page um, that will be moved over to, I can go there. So I, for, for those of you that weren't on the last two days. Um, so if you go to the SSDT meetings and trainings page, um, eventually what we're talking about in these overview sessions will be um, placed in this um, section here under training materials. But for right now, until um, the the other two sessions, overview sessions have been completed, you'll want to click um, off to the left hand side under ITC overview training and materials. And then again, we've um, broken this down into three sections, USAS, payroll and inventory and then um, broken it down by day as well. So eventually, you know, each day's recordings will be linked here. Um, and then each section of the recording will be linked in the appropriate area below um, under the appropriate day. So again, um, we're gonna finish up with after the payroll process and talk about all of those things um, that I just mentioned this morning. Okay, so if you need a reference back to anything, here's here's the place to go. All right, I'm gonna click here on the actual payroll process. And this is what we've been focused on the last two days and what we'll continue to um, focus on um, on our last day here. Um, and we're gonna pick up with um, step 23. So yesterday, Andrea ended the day with um, scheduling those direct deposit notices. Um, and this morning we're going to pick up with um, retirement reporting, as I as I mentioned before. So step 23 and 24 um, kind of are, are very, very similar. Um, they talk about, you know, creating those SERS and STRS per pay um, reports for verification and then also creating those submission files then um, to upload to the, the two different retirement systems. So that's what we'll talk about first. So if we go um, to our actual instance, um, the very first thing that you know districts wanna do anytime there's a report option available um, before you create the submission file, obviously they wanna create the reports first and then they can go to the actual, on to actually creating the submission file. So under reports, um, we'll talk about SERS first because that's first on the list. Under SERS reporting, there's SERS per pay report. So, um, you know, the the information that the district will need to to enter um, when creating the report is sort of supplied for you um, down below in this nice grid. Um, so when it comes to dates and so forth. Um, you know, you they can use this grid here to help determine, you know, if they don't have that information right in front of them, what do I use as the start date, the stop date, and then the pay date. 
So up, up above, they can change the file format if they like. Um, they can sort it um, by um, various you know, ways. It defaults to employee number. Um, by default, the begin each employee on a new page is unchecked. That could get very, very lengthy. Um, but if they do wish to do that, um, they have that ability. Um, by default, the show detail on the report option is checked. So they do want to um, obviously verify the information. And then um, show informational messages on the report, that's checked as well. <clears throat> One thing I want to point out um, that we have had several questions of late is um, down below here, we've we've changed this screen up a little bit so that um, we were hoping that um, it sort of brought to users' attention if they need to create an adjustments file. Um, it's kind of you know close or next to their regular submission file option, along with a note that says you know it, you know create this file if it's necessary. So one thing I can't stress enough is you know if you have any adjustments or anything that shows a negative on the report. Um, this adjustment file does have to be created and then submitted along with the regular submission file in order for things to balance. So I know in Classic, it created that file, you know, right along with the submission file. You know, when they, they opted the, selected the prompt to create the submission file, the adjustment file, if there was any that um, was generated automatically. Um, remember and redesign those are those are two separate files so you know it doesn't hurt anything if the district creates this file and it's empty you know give it a look make sure that you're not missing something um, and then if it's empty you know that that you know there's nothing there to report <clears throat> excuse me um, but that's a good way to to double check and make sure you're not going to miss something okay so when it comes to creating the, the report first. Um, again, as we've mentioned the last couple of days, you know, try to select your dates, but using the calendar pop-up, um, you know, tooltip, um, and that will eliminate the, the chance of entering something incorrectly, um, especially when it comes to the year, because at this point we don't have a check in the system um, to verify that the year is accurate. So, you know, anytime you can use that calendar to, to select the date, um, encourage your, your user, users to do so. So right down below, you can even see that, you know, the, the pay cycle for this district um, is set to biweekly. That tells us down here if, you know, you're working with a district and you're not sure. Um, and then the pay code is something, the pay cycle code, I'm sorry, is something that they set up um, with ESERS. Um, so, most likely that's like 001 or um, 002, um, something along those lines. And then again, um, as I mentioned before, your dates are down below. So the start date of your payroll, the end date of the payroll um, is, down, is down here. Remember if they have any additions or any other um, pay cycles that they need to report, you know, you're gonna continue to enter those on the, the additional line. So it captures, you know, all that additional information. We're going to click generate report. And again, the district is going to want to verify this report, double and triple check it, make sure that your total at the bottom of the report, and this is going to look ugly because of our test files. Remember um, that SERS requires days and hours for um, certain types of, of um, earnings codes. So make sure that if it's, you know, an earnings code that does require days and hours, that those are listed here, um, along with the, um, the employer pickup amount. So this should balance back to the, um, the pay item detail report or summary report, if you wanna use that. Um, that says this is what was withheld from the, the all of the employees during the payroll process. So if I go back to payroll, payroll processing, and I pull up the details of this pay, uh, payroll, I could use the um, pay item summary report if I want. 
Um, I like to use the pay on M detail report just because I can select those um, two payroll items that apply um, that I want to grab the totals for. So again, the employee amount is made up of two parts. So the 591 and the 691, and I'm going to generate the report for those two um, payroll items. And my total at the bottom for those two items should equal my um, withholding then for that's showing on my um, SERS per pay report. Okay, so that's a way to balance that. All right. Okay. I'm going to go back then. Oops to my SERS reporting, SERS per pay report. And again, you know, after the report has been double and triple checked, if there's any um, adjustments, maybe in hours or days that need to happen, um, districts can use, you know, core adjustments to adjust those um, days and hours that may have not gotten picked up or missed by attendance entries. Um, or um, the job calendar that the, um, the job is um, already assigned to. So you can see here under adjustments, there's reti SERS retirement days and SERS retirement hours. So those um, will are available if a district needs to adjust those for any reason. All right. I wanted to point that, point that out real quick. We'll go back to the per pay report. So if everything's you know good, um, everything looks fine on our um, report, then everything balances, then we're gonna go back and we're gonna basically just have to um, create the submission file. So once your dates you know are entered, your start and stop dates, your pay date, um, then we're gonna create again that submission file and also the adjustment only submission file. Again, this doesn't hurt anything. Um, if you wanna click that, um, just to be sure, um, you can do that. And if it's blank, obviously there's nothing there to report and you won't upload the file then to, to ESERS. Okay. So that is um, SERS per pay reporting. Please, anytime, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, put your place your questions in the chat. Um, interrupt me at any time. It, it's not a problem at all. So we're going to switch gears and talk about um, STRS reporting. Um, in my opinion, STRS is a little more user friendly um, than SERS is. So um, it's a little less cumbersome. Um, basically, again, you have the ability. You know, you can change the report title. As you're all familiar with, you can sort by um, name or SSN. Um, this really isn't relevant anymore unless you want to um, use it for reference. I am not even sure if you can send a check um, to STRS. I think they've switched everything to be electronic. I could be um, off base when I, when I say that, but I'm pretty sure that now everything's paid electronic. So this is basically for, for the user's reference if they want to you know, put some, some sort of transaction number in there for their own purposes, they can do so. Um, again, um, we want to create the report first. So down below, um, we're going to select, you know, the, the pay date that we're wanting to generate the report and submission file for, and we're going to click generate report. And again, just like we talked about with SCRS, the total at the bottom of the report should equal the payroll item um, detail report for the 591 and the 691. So that says, you know, things are in balance, everything's good, along with wanting to check um, the days that are listed on the report. Now, keep in mind, um, STRS does not um, days do not get included in the submission file on a per pay basis. 
So just because something, you know, days aren't listed for an employee um, doesn't mean that, you know, STRS is going to reject the file if it's zero, like SERS would. Um, this is, is listed on the, the per pay report for you to, to verify and be checking that on a, a per pay basis so that when you get to your annual reporting um, at the end of June, it's not so you know, overbearing. So if, if districts are checking this on a per pay basis and making sure that those days are accurate, you know, it, it will be less, you know, cause less headaches at the end of the fiscal year when that information is truly used and um, included in the submission file. Okay. So their percentage of credit is going to be, you know, determined by the number of days paid. So we want that to be accurate in the end. All right, so once the um, report is accurate, again, um, it's as easy as clicking the create submission file. And then actually, you know, that, that file then will get saved somewhere on your computer. Um, however your computer set up, whether it be, you know, going straight to your downloads folder and then you move the file somewhere on your computer that you, you know, might want to save that. Um, You'll browse to find the file, and then you upload that file to STRS, or you have the ability to generate the submission file and submit it to STRS all in one step. So districts have just a couple, you know, have a couple ways to do that. Um, some feel, you know, confident once the report's good, you know, not to have to go through those extra couple of clicks so they can generate that and submit it all in one step. Others you know, like to, to have a little bit more control over that process and do it you know, in a couple clicks. All right. So that is STRS and SERS, um, the per pay, um, creating those reports and um, submitting those to the to retirement systems. Um, next is submitting and, or, or I'm sorry, creating a report and submitting um, your new hire information to the retirement systems. So under each of those options that we just looked at, there's also a, a new hire um, report option. So um, under each of these steps, we've noted then the criteria um, that each new employee has to meet in order for those um, employees to show up in that the the um, appropriate new hire area. So for SERS, an employee has to have a 400 payroll item with the new employee box checked, and they have to hold a position um, that has SERS as the retirement code on the position screen, and a start date no more than 60 days um, from the current system date. So going back 60 days um, from the current date, that date can't be outside that window. One thing I wanted to point out because we have had questions on this, um, and I understand the logic, you know, you're, you're, you may have had new employees re, um, approved um, to be hired and you wanna get all their information in the system, get them um, set up, get them um, reported. If that date is in the future, they're not going to show up um, under the new hire area. So it has to be 60 days from the current date going back 60 days. Those are the only employee that will be um, included in the, in the new hire reporting um, as el being eligible to be being reported. Okay, so you can't report somebody in the future. And I guess that makes sense. Um, you know, it, what happens if a month from now, you know, that employee doesn't end up um, working um, at the district and you've already reported them that can cause some additional headaches. So um, just something to keep in mind because we have had questions on that. So, you know, when it comes to <clears throat> SERS, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's looking at um, the position record along with the 400 payroll item. Likewise, when it comes to STRS, it's looking at the 450 payroll item and then the same information on the position record. 
So let me just quickly show you. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but let's go to our Easter Bunny employee that we added on Monday. And here's just an example then of the 450 record that we're talking about. The new hire flag then has to be checked. So here's the new hire box. And then, oops, on the position record, the position start date has to be within 60 days, you know, going back 60 days um, of the current system date. So here's the start date. And then the retirement code has to be set to the appropriate, you know, SERS or STRS. So our examples then um, are Easter Bunny for STRS. So if I go to reports, go to STRS reports, I'm going to go to the STRS new hire report option. Because this employee meets all that criteria that we just talked about, it's going to show up then under as a, as um, a new hire to be reported. So, you know, if somebody's not a district um, employee is not showing up here, go through that series of checks to try to determine, you know, why they might not be showing up. <clears throat> the report option, I'll be honest, it doesn't give us a whole lot of information. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but here's, you know, the information that's included in this, the um, new hire submission file. Once the, you know, information has been verified, everything looks good. Again, when it comes to STRS, they have um, two ways to upload the information. Um, you can click the sub, uh, generate submission file option, um, then go down to the bottom, choose browse to choose the locate the file, and then upload the file to STRS. Or you can um, do what we just talked about all in one step, generate the submission file and submit it to STRS, you know, just in one, one click. So when it comes to SERS, here's our example of the SERS um, new hire um, employee that we have. Again, you have the option to generate the report. And here's then what that um, new hire report looks like for um, SERS. And then you can generate the submission file. Okay, I wanted to, to um, point out, I'm gonna close this stuff so we don't get confused. Um, when it comes to SERS new hire reporting, because we have had several questions on this um, regards to the changes that SERS has been making or has made um, and will be implementing um, regarding the, the, the um, email address. So, you know, make sure, first of all, um, that there is a phone number um, listed on the um, employee's record. Um, and then there is a, now the requirement of the email address. So what we're currently using is the other email address field. Um, and we've, you know, included this in the documentation. Um, I know there's been some questions and some concerns about this in regards to, um, you know, have sending the um, email notification to this address as well, because a lot of districts have that configuration screen set up um, to send the email notice to all um, email addresses. So when it comes to subs, you know, they're entering this primary email address because that's the email that um, is being used for payroll purposes. And then they're also listing that same email address in the other email field. Currently, um, and again, I apologize if Andrea touched on this yesterday, um, I wasn't able to sit in on our session, um, but currently the system will send that email to twice. So even though the email address is the same, it will send it to the primary and the other, even though they're 
the exact same notice or exact same email. The, the um, employee will currently get two email notifications to the same address. So there's been a JIRA issue created um, to um, look into that and to exclude it if it's the same, um, as well as for those of you that might be on the prioritization committee, um, I think Mark is planning to address this um, and touch upon this a little further at that meeting. So just keep in mind, you know, with the SCRS has changed, that's, that's how it's currently working, um, but look for there be, to be some possible changes in how that, that works going forward. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Um, so again, just, you know, going back to SCRS, you'll generate the report and then generate, you'll be able to generate the file and then upload that to ESERS. Okay. All right, I'm just making sure there's not any questions in the chat because I'm not always good about looking at that. So again, feel free to interrupt me. All right, so that is the um, new hire reporting for STRS and SERS. Um, next is um, processing your new hires um, when it comes to ODJFS. So again, um, you know, there's that window of time that new hires have to be reported to the Ohio Department of um, Job and Family Services. So um, what determines then um, whether an employee is, you know, shows up under that um, ODJFS new hire reporting area is actually, um, I guess we should add that to the, to the documentation there, shouldn't we? I'm gonna go back and pick on our employee, um, the Easter Bunny. And on the employee record, there's actually um, a field that says that this employee is ODJFS reportable. And then there's also the ODJFS hire date field. So these two work hand in hand. Don't get that confused with checking this box here. Once the employee has been reported through that new hire process, the system will automatically check this box. So this tells the system, this employee has already been reported, don't include them in, in future submission files, okay? All right, Amy, I'll get back to your question in one second, okay? I'm not ignoring you, good question. I'll get, circle back to that. Um, so uh, if this box here is checked and there's a date here, and let's just put in a date for our, Oops. For our um, purposes, then um, once we've submitted the um, new hire information and we've created that submission file and this employee has been included in that submission file, then that box is going to be checked. So we're going to go to reports, ODJFS reporting, ODJFS new hire report. And you can see that there's, you know, outside of Easter Bunny, there's other employees that have not been reported. We're gonna click, you know, those employees, move those to the selected side. And then there's this um, option here to include headers for your validation submission file. So if um, districts wanna, you know, take advantage of that validation, um, then, the ODJFS does require um, those that header row to be included. Um, they do not requ requ require it, excuse me, in the regular submission file. This is only for the validation submission. So um, if you click on the generate report option, you can see here then all of those employees that will be included in that um, submission file once we generate um, that that file. So you can verify that information, make sure everything's accurate, and then again, click on the generate submission file and upload that file to um, ODJFS. Okay. All right. Any questions when it comes to ODJFS reporting? That really hasn't changed in, in some time. Okay, I'm going to circle back to Amy's question in the chat that says, um, is the other email 
only important for new hire reporting. Um, if they manually enter new hires, will the other email address be needed? So if I understand your question correctly, Amy, so any new hire reporting, um, that other email address is what our system is using um, to upload, you know, and um, be used by ESERS. As far as if you they're manually entering it in ESERS, I'm assuming I, I'm we don't have an account to actually log in and view. Um, I'm thinking, you know, our our other email address is corresponding to whatever, you know, re email requirement ESERS is asking for. I'm not sure what that field is called or looking looks like. Um, but if they're manually entering it, I'm assuming, you know, there's going to have to be something on ESERS that says, you know, they're wanting they're wanting an email outside of their work email so that if that employee resigns from the district, they may no longer have access to their school or employer email. So there's they want something another forms of communication to to to, you know, talk to them. So that's really what the whole premise behind um, having that other email um, required. So, okay, perfect. Good question. Okay, so that's all, you know, the, the retirement reporting and the new hire reporting. Um, we're going to move on to then the afford report. Um, this is for your um, Affordable Care Act um, reporting. So this was what you know districts can use to help them um, with that reporting process. Again, this really isn't any different than what um, Classics Afford Report was. So under reports, there's the Afford Report. Um, again, you can change the report title, the sort um, options by name or number, um, your beginning and end date. So I did pull up you know, the documentation just because, um, whoops, find my, I thought I had it pulled up. I'll just go here. Our, you know, documentation kind of outlines the, um, the dates the districts are going to want to use, um, you know, based on, you know, how they're actually reporting the information. Um, so, you know, it's it's usually the period beginning and ending dates um, for that payroll. Um, again, we have examples. Um, you know, if if they're reporting weekly, if they're reporting monthly, um, and then you know the the end date is usually the period ending date for um, the payroll that they've just processed. But this, you know, go to the Ford direct your users to the Ford chapter if they have any questions on you know what dates um, they're using and every district reports this differently. So you can't really say this is the date they, you know, date range they should always use. Um, it's really on a district to district basis. So again, you're going to enter your dates here. Um, usually your, you know, it could be your period beginning and ending date. Some districts are reporting this monthly. So that's going to um, obviously not be the same. Um, include employees with no rehire, I'm sorry, retire hours. Um, you have the ability to check that box, exclude based on termination dates, exclude with um, employees that have insurance. Um, and then is it going to be calculated on weeks or months? Uh, and then you can also include a job calendar. That's, um, believe it or not, what this these uh, strange letters are, are, are job calendars. Um, so you can um, use a job calendar to calculate the breaks. Um, and then you can actually select pay groups. Remember, anytime that you have these selection options, um, by selecting nothing, you're selecting everything. So if there's nothing moved over to the selected side, that means everything will be included. So you don't have to move everything over, you know, every time you run um, or see any, see this um, selection, these selection boxes. So we're going to leave it default to everything, and then we're going to, you know, move down where you have the ability to select by employee, um, and then any employees that are selected will be moved down below. So you can generate the report first. 
Um, and that's going to give you the ability to look that over, make sure everything looks good, um, and then generate the CSV file to then upload to that um, you know, third party reporting party that the district is using for their Affordable Care Act tracking. Okay, so that, that really has not changed from Classic. So that reporting you know, tool has been out there for, gosh, it seems like forever ago. I don't remember a time when it wasn't, but um, it's been out there for a while. Okay, moving on then to steps 29 um, and 30, we're gonna talk about um, processing your employer and um, employer distributions and employer retirement share. So this was formerly board dis and then board ret. So you have, um, you know, employee, I'm sorry, employer withholdings that you've processed through the payroll system, um, maybe insurances, your employer share of Medicare, your um, employer share of retirement. So those obviously are not getting withheld from the employee's check, but they are included in the payroll process and all the reports. Um, so now what districts like to do is say, okay, these employer amounts, I want to create a report in a submission file that I can then convert into a purchase order on the USAS side and actually, you know, then eventually convert that into a disbursement or a check to actually, you know, expend that money on to those employer accounts and, you know, and cut a check to make those payments. So that's basically what, um, you know, these two processes are doing. So it's dealing with the employer side of um, those payroll items. So when it comes to um, the employer distribution, um, let's go back here, keep in mind, and I think a lot of times, believe it or not, it's amazing how many times this step gets missed. So under the report option, there, there are um, report options available for the employer distribution and employer retirement share. So this is like the projection option in um, Classic for board dis. So don't skip these parts. This is gonna give you a good means to look at what information is gonna be included in the submission file before that file is created, you have a chance to look at amounts, accounts, make sure your amounts balance um, before you're just creating the submission file and sending it over to USAS. So I'm gonna go to um, the employer distribution side first and our pay date that we have been using is, I know it's way in the past, um, but again, um, I wanna point out the start and the end date this this is controlled just like it was in classic by the history of the the payroll so pay date so this is pay date driven so if it's something that you're wanting to generate um, the submission file for on a per pay basis like maybe your medicare which is what we're gonna um, use in our example today then it's just gonna be probably one payroll so we're just gonna use the start and the end date um, equal to each other. Maybe it's your insurances. So those might be withheld over both pays um, or multiple pays throughout the month. So you would use the beginning pay date and the ending pay date to capture, you know, that whole month's worth of information. So again, pay date driven, just like classic. The pay cycle, the payment cycle, I'm sorry, um, you can choose if you um, if you'd like to, again, this is um, referring to the payment cycle on the payroll item configuration. So if I go to core payroll item configuration and I go to, we'll just pick on the 400 here. It's referring to this payment cycle here. So, you know, when we talk about paying your outstanding payables, we'll come back to this, but how are the pay, pay um, roll items paid, your payables paid? 
Um, usually we're using a payment cycle to, so we're not having to individually select each individual um, code um, or item by itself. You're selecting a payment cycle. So that's what um, the, the program is, is looking at. Probably most likely, um, the districts, when it comes to employer distribution, might be selecting those on a, a, a per pay, or I'm sorry, a per code basis. So if I, you know, am, am using and processing my um, employer distributions for um, just this payroll, I'm going to go down then and I'm going to select, okay, I'm also going to process my my Medicare, my retirement, those that are just, you know, processed on a per pay basis. And then maybe if it's at the end of the month, I'm going to go back and I'm going to select a different uh, date range and I'm going to process those that should be processed on a monthly basis. So I'm putting in those set of dates and then going down at the bottom and selecting, you know, all of those um, payroll items that pertain to that, you know, how you're paying them. So we're going to leave this blank because we're selecting the codes down below. And then how do I want them sorted in subtotal? Um, it's already you know defaulted to payroll item code, and that's probably how we how districts want to look at them and balance. Now here's something that um it gets confusing, I think. Um, but if you remember in classic, there was also um this prompt there that says. It's kind of an override field. So do I want the system to go back and look at the history for this payroll, for this payroll item, and just use those pay, um, those pay accounts that were flagged for employer distribution? Or do I want them to look at anything that was charged? So that's what um, this checkbox here does. So most generally, um, districts have those pay accounts um, set up with those boxes checked, how it's going to work for them when they do run their employer distribution. So I can't really tell you that, um, you know, they should always have this checked or unchecked because there are times when maybe they want their Medicare to be charged um, to um, all accounts, but they only want the benefits charged to like just the gen their general fund accounts and not grant accounts. So they have pay accounts, their pay accounts set up accordingly um, with that box checked or unchecked. And then they're using this um, checkbox here to either go back and look at the history and say only use those pay accounts that do have that box checked or uncheck it and say no matter how that box was checked charge everything or use all pay accounts in the charging process so it becomes a little messy um in in the fact that you can't always say you know check this box not check this box it's all in the matter of how the district individual districts wants their charging to happen and how they already have it set up on the system. Um, we're going to come back to this here um, in a second um, when we generate the report. And I'm going to show you that, you know, well, let's just do that. I'm going to generate the report. And I'm going to go back then to our um, payroll item detail report, like we did for retirement. This report is telling me that my total should equal $3,203.76. Okay, so that's what the system is coming up with as um, the amount that eventually my, um, you know, check or my disbursement is going to be created for on the USAS side, if everything gets processed as is. So the districts, once they, first they want to generate the report, then secondly, they want to verify that this amount is even accurate. So we're going to go back to the payroll process and the details of this payroll. And again, we're going to generate that payroll item detail report for 
our 692, too far, sorry. And I'm going to see if what was processed through payroll and quote withheld matches what my employer distribution report says. And you can see here, it does not. So my, what was processed through payroll shows $3,205.21. And my employer distribution report only shows $3,203.76. So my, if I processed everything as is, I'm actually gonna be off, you know, um, I think it was $3.25. So how do I find that, you know? So one thing to do is if I go back to my employer distribution report, and I'm gonna enter all my selections again, but this time I'm gonna uncheck this box here and you can see what it does. When I open this report and I go to the bottom, look, my total now matches what was processed through payroll. This tells me that one or more pay accounts did not have that employer distribution box checked when it was processed through payroll, okay? How do I find out who that was? So back in, um, back last year, we actually did a, a training session on um, employer distribution and re employer retirement share. Um, if you go out to last year's training, um, that's going to be, oh, right here. If you're interested in reviewing recordings of last year's training, click here. If you go to the training session, that we held, which is right here, November 18th. Um, there's actually a couple documents that I wanted to point out um, that we created to hopefully help step you through not only the charging process, how the system is arriving at the final account that it's charging, but also this um, report definition here that can be downloaded and imported using your um, report manager to help determine how those pay accounts looked at the time the payroll was run. So were those you know, boxes were on those pay accounts checked or unchecked at the time the payroll was run? Here's the document that we put together. So this might be helpful to go back out um, and look at, and it steps you through the charging process. So first of all, how is the, system arriving at the account that it finally ends up charging. And, you know, for time purposes, you know, and we're going to do this session again, I'm not going to go through um, the charging process per se. Um, but again, remember that, you know, the payroll item configuration, object code gets substituted um, based on the original object code um, that the pay account was paid um, or used, charged, that gets substituted. Um, then the mapping gets applied. Um, and then there's also this account mapping configuration to tell the system how far along in the account dimension do you carry forward those dimensions. So based on this account mapping configuration, do we carry forward all account dimensions or do districts have their account set up to maybe, you know, not carry forward um, all account dimensions? So refer to this um, document if you do have questions as far as like, you know, how is how is the system coming up with that final account that it's charging? Hopefully this document will, will be helpful um, in, you know, looking at that. This file here, um, again, you can download this report definition and then import that into your instance. And that's going to tell us then how those accounts looked at the time the payroll was run. 
Okay, let me read this question real quick before we get too far away from what we're talking about. We checked a box for regular position accounts, but not for subs or extra bus trips. This is used to charge our insurances. It would be unchecked for Medicare. Yeah, and that's where, I, you know, every district they're charging the way they want to charge things is set up slightly differently. And then, you know, how they're, again, you know, when I was talking about, I can go to that um, configuration option. I lost my train of thought here. This account mapping configuration, that's what I was talking about to, to, you know, how the system determines to carry forward all account dimensions um, of that, you know, benefit account or to drop those um, certain account dimensions and fill that in with zeros. So, uh, you know, going back to the, the statement, I, everybody has their account. Uh, chart of accounts set up differently, how they want their, their um, you know, insurances, Medicare, those sorts of things um, charged. So it's hard to say this is exactly how you should have it set up. This is exactly how you should run, you know, and check or uncheck this box because it is so different um, for each district. If you ever have questions with, you know, a district is struggling to get their accounts um, charged correctly and you know maybe every time they're having to manually make a lot of changes on the USAS side um, let's get that let's work together to get that set up and corrected so um, that isn't something that they have to do pay after pay after pay and it's just you know almost trial and error um, you know checking this box unchecking the box how do they want their accounts charged you know setting up that configuration screen right so that um, the right account dimensions get carried forward and you know there's so many parts to the to the whole that um you know it's just really is um a district to district um setup um okay all right so getting back to our report i think oh i wanted to show you the actual report so we've already downloaded that file um, and imported it or downloaded that report definition and imported it. So now if I go ahead and I generate the report, you know, obviously you just want to generate this for the specific payroll you're working with or the date, the payrolls you're working with. I'm going to open this up. And this tells you then how um, those pay accounts were charged. So you could filter this um, column then and, you know, only list the false um, pay accounts. So you're kind of narrowing down um, this report um, and you can see exactly how those um, accounts were flagged for employer distribution at the time the payroll was run. Okay. All right. I actually, um, you know, cheated and I know who you know the two employees are I, I found those um so you know you could go in then um you know and map things if you needed to or you can adjust the purchase order on you know the payroll side um but you that's a good way to find then you know where the where the um discrepancy is for our sake and purposes you know we know that when I checked the box, then those totals balanced, all right? So when I go then to create the submission file for this example, I'm going to uncheck this box just so our totals balance, all right? Now, when you uncheck this box, keep in mind, um, too, it's an all or nothing thing. So if districts have accounts that they truly don't want charged and they uncheck this box, it is going to use any pay account that was charged in, you know, during the payroll process and charge those accounts accordingly. So it might not always, you know, you can maybe use this to 
find where the problem is, but may not work just to leave this box unchecked and expect all the account charging to work out the way the district you know, expected it because it is an all or nothing thing. All right, so once you are good with your report, I didn't enter that correctly. You're basically going to go to the um, under UCS integration, the employer distribution submission option, and you're going to enter the exact same information that you use to generate the report. So again, the dates, I'm going to uncheck this just so you can see then that um, we're going to be in balance. I'm going to move that selected payroll item or Medicare because that's what we're um, working with right now. And I'm going to click the show submission preview. And you can see here then it gives me the um, ability to check this total one more time. So when I click this um, show submission preview, I can then click submit to USAS. And it tells me that this submission file was successfully sent to USAS. It then is going to show up in this grid. Um, and it says, it tells me the status. So it's submitted to USAS. Now I would go and take care of things on the USAS side, um, which we're not going to go through for sake of time today. Um, you know, you would go in, it would be under the pending transactions area, and you'd complete the process on the USAS side to, you know, eventually get the disbursement. Okay. So as, as things are happening on the USAS side, this you're going to see this status um, change as well. All right. So that is um, the employer distribution um, process. There's also a report option, as we've mentioned, for the employer retirement share. So this is for um, your um, foundation payments. So for those that are um, you know, used to using board RET in Classic, this is the replacement for board RET. Um, you'll enter your dates. So probably it's you know, gonna be for a month. So you can enter you know, the, the first of the, that month and then the last of that month. And then you're gonna enter then the um, amounts that you need to distribute for your STRS payment and your SERS payment. You're gonna generate the report. And again, then here are my two accounts. Um, keep in mind that employer retirement share does use account mapping as well. Um, so in that, um, on that same wiki page, go back here and see if I can find it. We also have um, a document for um, employer retirement share that steps you through that charging process and how that works. So if you're you know, having questions on how is it arriving at the account that's showed on, shown on the report um, and that will eventually be on the submission file, you know, Hopefully this um, document will help you um, in that um, area, okay? Um, there is also a quote override option um, in, when it comes to the employer retirement share. And I think a lot of times this gets forgotten as well. Um, it's, whoops. Go to configuration. Um, and it is the employer retirement share configuration. And here's that same override field when it comes to employer retirement share. So in, on employer um, distribution, it's right on the actual screen itself on the report and on the submission option. Um, here it's actually um, a configuration option. So don't forget about this. Um, this allows, again, that override option to only use those employer, those flagged for employer distribution or use all accounts, no matter how that flag is checked or unchecked. Um, likewise, 
it's going to use that same account mapping to know what account dimensions to carry forward in that um, account charging process. So don't forget about this as well. And again, um, that going back to that document that we have, it's it actually um, you know steps you through substituting the object code on the payroll item configuration, the mapping, and then the configuration option that's used. So hopefully you'll find those documents and that report definition helpful. Um, again, it's on you know right on the the training sessions wiki page. So if you need to reference that for any reason, don't hesitate to go out and, and grab those. So once you know the report option um, of employer retirement share, that amounts again have been verified, um, everything looks good. Under USAS integration, there's um, the employer retirement share submission. <clears throat> Let me circle back to that, your question in just one second, Brenda, okay? Um, so once <clears throat> we have generated the report, again, always go and use that report first. Um, enter the beginning and ending dates for um, the um, pay, the date uh, range that you're creating the submission for. So basically you're repeating the same information that was um, used when you generated the report. Enter your amounts again. And then we're gonna click the show submission preview option. It's gonna give us the um, amount then to verify one more time. And then we're gonna submit that, um, this submission file to USAS as well. And then it's going to give us then our um, two submission files in the um, grid to the right. And you can also see the statuses just like we talked about. Excuse me one second. Okay. Um, there was a question um, about where you get the report um, definition that I talked about. And I'm sorry if I went too fast. and. Didn't make that clear. Let's go back to. So if you go to our um, SSDT meetings and trainings page, there's um, a, a little note um, and the second line on that note says, I'm sorry, that's not it. The second line here on the bullet, um, if you're interested in reviewing um, the recording sessions that took place last year, we're going to click here. So this takes us, takes you to the outline of all of those sessions that we did in 2022. And if you scroll down to November, we did a session um, in November um, called Employer um, Distributions and Employer Retirement Share. And here's the documents that, and the report definition that we were talking about. So Employer Retirement Share, Employer Distribution, and then that report definition that can be downloaded and then um, imported to help you determine how those pay accounts looked at the time the payroll was processed. Okay. All right. Moving right along then. You're very welcome. The next step then in the payroll process is creating your um, ACH and your HSA files. Now, some may think, you know, we posted the payroll yesterday and, you know, I want to get that to the bank right away. Again, these are just, this is just a, a, a payroll um, outline. The nice thing about redesign is there's very few steps that have to be, you know, one right after the other or in a set place. Um, unlike classic, where you had to really process everything in a specific order. Um, the reason this is, these are sort of towards the end of the payroll process is once this file, this HSA file is created, your payroll then becomes unpostable. So if your district has an HSA um, in place and they create that submission file, 
you're going to see that that post pay uh, on post payroll, excuse me, option becomes um, unhighlighted. So it's not going to be available for them to unpost the payroll. So we've sort of moved this down towards the end because that's can be your point of no return. If the district does not have an HSA in place and they're not creating any submission file for that for HSAs, then your outstanding payables becomes your point of no return. So once you've posted your payables, you're going to see the unpost payroll option become unavailable. So these two are sort of towards the end, just because, um, you know, if we want to kind of save that until the very end, just in case there is, I mean, a, 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 you know, you, a district does have to unpost their payroll for whatever reason. Okay, again, you can move these steps around, you know, move your HSA, HSA and ACH files up to be before what we've just talked about. Just know that, you know, once this is created or your payables are posted, um, you, you can't go back. Okay, so creating your HSA and ACH files. So um, under reports, there's the ACH submission option. And within that option are the ability to create both of your um, submission files for ACH and HSA, if that applies um, to the district. So when it comes to your HSA file, um, again, the pay date is this date here is defaulted based on the pay date that was entered when we initialized the payroll. So, you know, double and triple check this date um, because if A, they've entered a wrong date as the pay date when they initialize the payroll, then this truly can become a problem, you know, when um, they create their HSA file, I'm sorry, their ACH file, um, but this date can be changed. So, you know, just double and triple check this. Um, some districts also like they allow their, um, the pay date might be on a Friday, but they allow um, their employees access to their direct deposit a day or two earlier. So um, this date is, again, change, you know, you can change this, but just verify, you know, double and triple check that this date is, is what the district needs it to be. The ACH source is going to default then um, from the um, uh, core ACH source that's set up. Um, so that's where that's pulling from. <coughs> Include the employee SSN. Um, by default, the social security numbers are not reported, are included, I'm sorry, on um, the report or submission file. Um, I think a lot of banks have done away with this. Um, there might be some out there that still are requiring it. I'm not you know, sure of every each and every single bank's um, you know, how they they require the, the ACH file to look. But by default, this is not included, but you can change it if, if um, need be. And then by default, it's sorted by name. Again, you can change that to be sorted by ID. And then the report format is defaulted um, in uh, PDF format. So the first thing the district is gonna to wanna to do is come down and select the payroll um, that they want to generate the report for. Again, always, you know, generate the report before just creating the submission file. I know that sounds silly, but I've seen so many times where, you know, they're they're so confident or, you know, just under time constraints and they just skip. This is kind of the projection option anytime you see that. So, you know, emphasize that checking and double checking is only going to save them, you know, headaches in the future. Um, so click the uh, report option. So down here, um, going back, we've, we've selected the pay date, and now we're going to generate the report. So this report total, so if we go down um, and check the ACH report total, this total here should match the amount that's on our pay um, report. So if the, if you go back to the pay report, uh, you know within the details of the payroll, 
this there's a total direct deposit that's listed on the report itself. So it's saying that this is how much when we process payroll, this is how much you know the system calculated that the direct deposit file should be created for. So now we're creating our submission file. It's saying that that um, amount in the file is exactly the same as what our payroll, um, when we process the payroll said it should be, so we're good. Um, so always double check those totals and make sure they match. Obviously this is a good plate, good report to check if there's been any um, changes you know, in accounts. Um, you can double and triple check those and make sure that you know everything looks good on the report. Once we verify the information, the account, um, or I'm sorry, the total matches, then we can generate the submission file. So the only real thing that we should have to change is again, double and triple checking our pay date, um, make sure our options, you know, haven't are 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 good um, and as expected. There's a convert prenotes um, on ACH submission file generation checkbox. So what this does is it goes out and it basically makes those, um, those pay distributions that are set to be prenotes for either a checking or savings. It's going to cha change those to be, quote, like an active or, um, you know, uh, um, demand, I think that's what they're called, um, so that next time the employee is paid, they will actually get a true direct deposit, um, you know, by ACH and not a paper check. So until these, um, the prenotes are changed, they're going to continue to get a paper check time after time after time. So always make sure that, you know, if you have a district that is still using prenotes, um, uh, for their direct deposits that this box gets checked so that next time, you know, the employee will get a direct deposit um, as expected and not a paper check. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if for whatever reason, um, a district needs to go back and create um, an ACH file or a report for any reason, if you click the display all payrolls, those past payrolls are listed um, and available for the district then to, to select and, and do something with, okay? I'm gonna go to the pay distribution and I'm just gonna show you quickly what I was talking about when I said um, the pre-note, um, changing the pre-note. So um, here's then the direct deposit type on that pay distribution field. So there's the pre-note options for checking and savings. So if we check that box, once the submission file is created, they're going to be um, switched to be a demand of credit um, or a, a demand basically of savings. So it'll switch it to whatever, whichever of these two options applies, whether it's a checking or savings account. And then going forward, they're gonna get um, a direct deposit and not a physical check. So that's what I'm talking about um, when we re refer to the, that checkbox um, here. Okay, so that is then creating the um, ACH report and the submission file. And then obviously, you know, every district has their own method then to get, you know, upload that file then to their whatever bank they're using. Um, but once the file's created, they're ready to do that. So they can follow their own individual steps to, to get that to the bank. When it comes to the HSA submission file, um, we don't have one set up in these test files. So that's why the, the source isn't listed again under the AC under core and then ACH source. Um, you would set up that HSA um, source there, and then that would be listed here. And it's pretty similar to then your a ACH submission file. You have the same sort option, the report option. Down below, you're gonna select then that um, appropriate payroll that you wanna create the report for. So you're gonna create your HSA report, verify, make sure that looks good. And then you're gonna create your submission file. 
And then obviously, like we just mentioned with the ACH file, you're gonna, districts will then use their um, own steps, um, you know, depending on the bank that they're working with to get that file then to the bank. All right. Are there any questions when it comes to the HSA or ACH files? All right. Moving right along then, um, we're gonna move on to um, processing your outstanding payables. So again, um, if your district does not have an HSA, um, when you post your payables, this is the point of no return. So if you want to see what I'm talking about, if I go to the details of the payroll, you can see right now that this unpost payroll option is um, available for me. So if a district would need to go back for whatever reason and um, you know almost start over, um, you can unpost the payroll um, and it will put everything back to but right before you posted it. Um, and then you can make the changes and post it again and, and continue in the process. Um, you know, I do caution districts when they're unposting um, to be mindful of what else they may have done. Um, you know, you might have to reach out to your bank if you've already created your ACH file, HSA file, uploaded those to the bank. Um, you know, have you processed your email notifications? You know, you might have to go out and cancel that job in the job scheduler and reschedule those. You might have to reprocess your payments if you have physical payments, because that, um, when you unpost, that um, basically unassigns those check numbers. So there's a lot of things to consider um, before just going out and clicking that unpost payroll button, but it is available and it's a wonderful tool. You just have to kind of be mindful of, you know, what else you might have to um, redo basically. Um, by clicking that button. Okay. All right. So um, going to processing. If I click processing outstanding payables, um, we're going to see multiple tabs here. So um, basically, when you click the tabs going to the, the next three tabs going to the right, this then gives you a different way to look at the grid that you see here. So the first grid, it's showing it um, listed by payee. So if you have multiple payroll items that are being paid to the same payee, maybe your um, OSDI tax, maybe some like annuity annuities that you have set up like um, American Fidelity, those sorts of things where you, you have them set up to be withheld separately but you want them, they're all going to the same place. So you're, you only wanna cut one check and not five, 10, whatever it may be. So this is giving you a look by payee and the total employee amount and total employer amount, the count, and then whether it's gonna be paid electronically or by a physical check. When I go to the right then, this is now giving me the look based on payroll item configuration code. So if I want to look at a total just for, I'm gonna pick on this annuity, whoops, it helps if I type correctly. So if I just wanna look at the specific annuity, I can filter and it's gonna show me the amount for Daisy Textiles is, you know, 103,000 and something. So this gives you a way, and, and, and this to me is, you know, helpful because in classic, we sort of remembered um, payroll items, what they are now by code. So um, I know that you know all my 800s are my OSDI taxes. If I want to look at just those, you know, I can I can filter this grid and look at it by the code. And then moving to the right, um, this gives us the pay payables by pay item payroll item. So again it gives you more details and it gives me everybody that might have paid into that 543 code. So the it's breaking it down 
again, and giving us a different way to look at what makes up that total on the first um, tab. And then lastly, the payables detail breaks it down even further. So it kind of depends on, you know, what districts are wanting to look at, check, um, you know, how they want to look at things um, as far as what which tab they might use um, before they actually process their, their payables. Okay, the last tab here is when um, districts need to alter the amount of a check. So maybe they've um, processed a refund to an employee, which we know in turn comes out and places that as a negative um, in the outstanding payables. Maybe the district then in turn does not want their next payable check to be shorted by that refund amount. So you can create payables adjustments to offset um, or change the amount of that you that you see on that first tab. So if I click the payables adjustment amount, let's just go back and pick on one so we can make it a little more clear. Okay, so I'm gonna go to this um, Adele accounting and it's for $43 and I'm gonna have to see which, Okay, so it's um, code 603. And I'm gonna see who actually had that withheld so that I know who I need to make the, a, a payables adjustment to. Okay, so we're gonna pick on Ethan Rice. Um, maybe, you know, we refunded this $4 to Ethan Rice, but we don't want the check to be shorted by his refund of $4. So I'm gonna to go to this payables adjustment tab. I'm gonna click create and I'm gonna enter rice. I'm gonna find Ethan Rice and I'm gonna select payroll item 603. And I think that's one area where we have to fix the, we're gonna select payroll item 603 and I'm going to enter then um, a negative $4 because I don't want the check then to be shorted by his refund. I'm kind of doing it backwards, to be honest, but you get the gist. Um, so you can um, put in the amount then. Um, if you're doing a refund, typically the amount would be a negative. So we wouldn't want it to short. So we're gonna use a positive. So I'm kind of doing using this example and entering the amount backwards. But think of a refund as a negative. So now it's going to short our next check. We don't want that amount to be shorted by that refund. So we would enter a positive amount to offset that negative. So the amount of my, our, our check would remain as we, we would expect. So in this case, I'm kind of entering the amount as a negative. So just disregard that. All right. So if I go back to, and I save that, I go back to um, that original payee, I can see then that in this case, my check has been shorted. Most cases you would see it the opposite if we're talking about a refund, um, but I this is the amount that I truly need to send this, um, this deduction company. I need to pay them $39. So I've created a payables adjustment, so that my check now is the correct amount that I want to be sent. So again, keep in mind this payables adjustment does allow you to alter the amount of a check. The very first thing that districts wanna do when they come to the outstanding payables area is click on this payables reports um, button. Um, you have the ability to change the format if you'd like. So if they wanna, you know, verify or need need the ability to dump this into some kind of spreadsheet because they keep that for, you know, as they're, they're balancing throughout the year, um, they have the ability to do that. Um, the other nice feature is to um, um, start each payroll item code on a new page. So if this is a report that they're using to send with some sort of payment, you probably want that clean break so that, you know, my Oh, one starts on a new page, my oh, two starts on a new page and so forth. So then I can just pull out 
the part of the report that I need to send with that payment. Um, and it's all nice and clean and I don't have to um, make any changes. This payment cycle, um, we kind of touched upon that earlier when we were talking about the employer distribution. So most, I think most times districts are using that payment cycle to make their payments um, to their um, uh, deduction companies. So, um, you know, again, it's matching what we select here with that payment cycle on the payroll item configuration screen. So that if I'm selecting those that should be every pay, it's going out and it's matching that, that field then, just to refresh your mind, if I go to the payroll item configuration and I look at this payment cycle field here, um, it's, you know, those, that's what it's looking at to match, to know what um, payables to pull in and into the report. And then obviously um, process those payments when we select a process to post those, those checks. Okay. So that's the field that it's looking at when we um, uh, define a payment cycle or payment cycles. So maybe it's the big, just the first pay of the month. And I just, you know, I'm processing those that are to be paid every pay. Maybe it's the second pay of the month and I have payments set up to be every, to be paid every pay as well as monthly. Maybe it might be the end of the quarter and I have um, the last pay in the quarter and I have some um, deductions that are only to be paid on a quarterly basis. And I have those set up as, with the payment cycle equaling quarterly. So you can, districts can select then, you know, as many payment cycles as they, they have set up and meets the pay of the month that they're wanting to pay or process payables for. There's even user-defined cycles. So if those are being used um, on the payroll item configuration, the district will have to know then that, you know, user defined one means uh, maybe after the second pay, if it's a three pay month um, and so forth. So these mean something, you know, at the district level um, and can mean something different district to district. All right, we're just gonna select every pay. Um, the other option then to um, pay your payables is a by code. So maybe districts, um, this seems like kind of um, a lot of effort to me, but um, if they don't have payment cycles set up, they could go through then and select um, by payment, uh, I'm sorry, by payroll item configuration or the code. So, um, or maybe, you know, they forgot to process um, you know, a payment cycle, or if they just want to process their insurances because they're ready, you know, it's the second pay um, of a three pay month and all their insurances are withheld. They don't have that set up on a specific payment cycle. They can go down and, and specifically pull out those payroll item codes that they want to be paid. <clears throat> so once you have all of the, um, either payment cycles and or pay payroll codes um, that you want to be paid, there's two reports and I highly recommend that they um, run both of those reports. One's the full report, so it's gonna give you the detail of each and every employee and the breakdown by um, payroll item code. And then one is the summary. So by um, code, what's the amount, what amount's gonna be paid, okay? So here's the summary. And I know some districts, you know, have a spreadsheet or something that they keep um, pay to pay so that that helps them balance at the end of the month, into the quarter, calendar year, fiscal year, all those good things. So this is gonna give them um, that information by code of each, the payment that's being processed um, at this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. The detail then, um, is going to break it down by code and then by employee and the amount then that's um, being withheld um, for each payroll item code that we're processing. Okay, so again, first thing that they want to do um, when they go into their outstanding payables is generate these reports 
look over those reports, make sure that everything looks good. You know, that's a good way to check. Maybe they've had insurance changes, you know, um, changes in specific employees, um, payroll items. They can, you know, look at the detail report and the full report and <clears throat> verify that information is accurate. Once then they're ready to process um, their um, payables, we're basically going to do the same thing. So we're going to go over here and we're going to select that pay, those payroll um, codes that apply. And as soon as I start selecting um, a payment cycle, you can see that my grid changes. So it's going out and it's matching then those payment cycles on the payroll item configuration. And then whatever I select here, it's you know qualifying that that grid and these then are the payables that I once I move them to the posted side will be paid. So once I have everything listed in my grid that's appropriate for the time that I'm wanting to um, pay, then I can simply check this select all checkbox and that's going to move them to the right hand side. I can just verify one more time that these are all accurate. And yes, I want to pay those. I'm going to select post. Now, and this is going to bring up a pop-up window and allow me then to create my payments um, for my physical checks. So here's the issue date. It's going to default to the current um, system date. I'm going to change this just so it matches. A lot of times districts once want their payables to be dated the same as their pay date. Um, that just makes sense um, for auditing purposes and you know balancing purposes. So I'm going to make that be um, my pay date. It should default to the, the bank account um, that's set up as the default bank account. <clears throat> and then based on your um, third party printing software. Um, I think most generally, you know, that's going to be XML. Um, so you want to make sure that that, bot, that um, option is selected and then it's going to default to my next starting check number. I'm going to click post. So it's posting my, creating my payables and posting those. And it's also going to give me, um, oh shoot. If you ever um, run into this, um, a lot of times for the first time, um, and hopefully districts are past this by now, but sometimes I think it also happens when they have updates to their computers. Um, there's a pop-up blocker that comes on in a couple places throughout the application, and one of them is here. Um, so it doesn't mean that the files didn't get created. It just means that they're not going to pop up on my screen and allow me to see them because that pop-up blocker was, was on. So you should be able to go to the file archive. And unfortunately, we don't have that turned on in our... Oh, maybe we do. I lied. Let's see here. I guess we do. Am I bad? I misspoke. Um, you should be able to go to the file archive and under the payee payment detail folder, um, you should see that those reports then are listed um, for me to, to view, download, whatever I need, need to. So you can go back and look, you know, download your checks.xml file. Um, or, you know, in this case, I don't I didn't have that payables um, payment report that I was going to show you. So I can go to my file archive and grab that. So once you post your payables, it does generate another, a third report. And this is going to give me um, the check number or the electronic transaction number, um, the date that it was, the check was issued for, who the payment was made payable to, the amount, the code or codes that were involved, and then the amount. So again, this is also another report I think districts use um, you know, when they're balancing, um, you know, for the month, the quarter, and the fiscal year, calendar year, and so forth. So they might grab and have their own spreadsheet set up and use this to, you know, either create in um, 
their own format or use, you know, when they're when they go to balance at those appropriate times of, of the year. So again, keep in mind that, you know, if for whatever reason they can't find that checks.xml file um, on their computer any, ever, anywhere, go out to the file archive and look in that payee payment detail folder um, because that checks.xml file, if it truly got created, um, a copy of it is in that folder. Okay, as well as the other um, two reports that we talked about earlier. Um, the only bad thing about these is they might not be set up in the exact order that the district um, ran them for. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's set up to be generated in one specific way. So if they want and like those, prefer those to be run in a, you know, more user-defined manner, then make sure that they're saving those, you know, when they run them before they post their payables. So that way they look the way that they expect them to. Um, if not, don't, you know, don't um, forget that those reports are out there. They just not might not be in the format that they, they like them in. Okay. All right. So that is processing um, the outstanding payables. I don't think that there's anything else that I needed to talk about here. Um, you know, just keep in mind that, and I'm sure you're all aware that, you know, the payables that we did not select to post then are going to remain out in this outstanding payables area. Um, and as payrolls are processed, these amounts, then you're going to see those change based on, you know, the payrolls that have been posted and those amounts that have been withheld um, from those payrolls, you know, are going to continue to get added to the amounts you see here until we, we post, select those payables to be posted and, and the grid is cleared. Okay. All right. Going back to our checklist then, um, the last thing, and I see we're running way past time again, and I'm so sorry. Um, the last thing um, we want to talk about is uh, accruing benefits. So again, under processing, um, there's a benefit update and projection option. Um, again, you're going to see various tabs. Um, and the two we're going to focus on um, and talk about this morning are the accrual option and the reset personal leave option. So again, yesterday, or I'm sorry, Monday, when we talked about, I'm just going to go to this new leaves view. <clears throat> the the eligibility flags are actually set up on the position record. So if I go to the position record first, and I'll show you, these flags here determine, you know, if the employee is um, going to accrue or um, get that kind of leave when we run through the processes that we're going to talk about. So it's all controlled by these check boxes on the position record. And then again, some important things that we talked about Monday when it comes to accruing is first, this value here has to be in place. So the accumulate, accumulate per month value has to be set. There also has to be a max leave amount defined. And then the unit, whether it's either accrue, leave, hourly, or daily, those three pieces when you're accruing all have to be in place in order for the accrual to take um, place and the balances to be updated correctly. Okay. When it comes to, whoops, we were already there, personal leave, um, you're probably not maybe accruing that like you are sick leave and vacation. Um, you're just resetting it. So there has to be a reset value here in order for that reset um, benefit to be reset and, and <clears throat> uh, correctly. Okay, so now if we go back to processing benefit update and projection, <clears throat> the first thing we're gonna talk about is accrual. So that's the first tab. 
You can change the report title to be anything you want. So maybe you're you know, wanting to change that to be the appropriate month that you're accruing the leave for. Excuse me, one second. I'm so sorry, I had a little throat. Um, you can change the uh, report format. So if we wanna generate this in something other than PDF, I have you have that ability. And then again, just like we've talked about before, uh, you know, uh, select and run the projection option first before you change it to the actual accrual report. So you first wanna look at the report. So generate the projection report. You have the ability to select um, multiple leave types. So we can select all leave types. So if you accrue, you know, all your um, benefits the same way, sick, personal, and vacation, um, and you know your your vacation and or personal leave is not accrued differently, then you can set this um, option to all leave types. Um, most districts or some districts like the ability to, acc they're accruing their vacation and sick leave. So they'll change um, this option to, to be those two benefits. And then you want to specify the actual accrual date. So this is district specific. You know, some like to accrue it um, a specific, you know, the last day of the month, the first day of the month, after their first pay roll of the month. So that's pretty much like a negotiated agreement um, thing. So um, you'll want the districts will want to you know put in the date that applies to um, the month that they're accruing the leave for. You have the ability to include in, ineligible positions if you'd like. By default, that is not checked. And then just like other reports, you have the ability to change the sort option. So if we want to um, you know run this by name um, and name order, we we can do that. And then again, there are some times I think when districts do run this report by pay groups, because maybe for whatever reason, your classified might be different than your certified. Um, so you can pick the appropriate pay groups that apply to this particular, um, you know, projection and actual option of um, accruing your benefits or resetting your your leave. Um, again, by not selecting any, all are going to be selected. If you want to choose specific employees, you have that ability as well. So I'm going to generate this report. Um, take a quick look at that. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but again, just like the Ben Ack report in Classic, um, it lists the name, the ID the appointment type, what their balance was, what the accumulation will be, and then what their balance bill will be after um, it's accrued. All right, we, we run the actual option. So in this case, we ran it for both vacation and sick. So we show both um, of those benefits on the report. Once you have you know, verified that the report looks good, all is well, we can simply change this to be the accrual report. And then once we click generate report, this is going to go out and then actually change or update that employee's balance. Okay. Likewise, um, there's another tab um, that involves employee benefits, and that's resetting personal leave. So maybe now, you know, this time of year is, might not be the, the time that districts are doing this. Usually it's, you know, at the start of the school year, um, but you do have the ability, you know, whenever it's appropriate um, to first, again, run a projection option. Um, you'll enter the specific accrual date, just like we talked about with the um, accrual option. You have the ability to include an ineligible positions sort it by name or number, include specific pay groups. Um, you'll again, run the report option, verify that, make sure everything looks good. And once it is, and we, we know everything's good to go, we simply change this to be the personal leave reset report. And this will actually go out then 
and reset the employee's leave to whatever that reset value is that we just looked at um, on the employee's leave screen. So again, it's wiping out what, what was already there and resetting it to whatever that reset value is. So it's you know different than accruing the leave. All right. Okay. That is um, the leave accrual process. The last two items on the checklist are simply um, links to refunding a payroll item and then processing a special pay. Um, we're not going to go into details you know, of, of those, um, but I, I did want to point out that they are on the checklist. So if you click the link to either of these, that will take you to a separate checklist and step you through um, those two processes if, if need be. Okay, that is all I have for this morning. Again, I apologize because I must be long-winded and it's way past our time that we said that we hope to stay within. So I apologize for that. Um, before I wrap things up and close things for today, are there any questions about anything we talked about this morning or anything in the last three days at all? Okay. Um, seeing there are no questions, um, I do want to thank everybody for their time. Um, again, you know, we have updated this checklist and made it, you know, hopefully a lot, put a lot more detail in, in it, um, changed things up as far as the order goes, and hopefully it makes more sense. Um, and, you know, you can, I know districts have probably are past the point of, you know, creating something new, but if you do have questions or um, want to, you know, create something new for your districts to start using, hopefully you'll find this, this helpful um, in, you know, making it their own. Thanks again for everybody's time the last three days. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.